Dr. Taylor, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am doing good. I'm uh, pumped to get into all things autoimmunity today. I think it's one thing that the mainstream really struggle, mainstream doctors really struggle to treat. You know, we, uh, we're really good at like the acute injuries and the acute issues. But when it comes to these chronic long term issues, this seems where modern medicine really struggles and uh, just love the work that you've been putting out in, in that front. Thanks. I appreciate it. I, I, I completely agree. There's a, you know, just a wave of of autoimmunity, just kind of as a, you know, a, a diagnosis wave. Um, but also I, I would describe it as more of just like a mechanism more than a, a, a specific disease. You know, there's over a hundred known autoimmune names now, diseases, diagnoses, but it's more of a mechanism. And so that's kind of what I try to teach is uh, how that, how those complex mechanisms all just intertwine. So thanks. So what do you mean by that? When you say mechanism, is that just, well, the just immune the, system is overactive. Exactly. And, and attacking self tissue. So okay. the immune system is not supposed to attack self tissue. It's supposed to attack foreign tissue. And so when that attack is misdirected, that's basically the definition of, of what autoimmune autoimmunity is. Um, and so there's also, you know, I, I have a, I, I, all these things, I kind of sometimes even forget what I have out there. And I've learned all this from mentors. So I always try to give credit to whoever I've learned this from, but autoimmunity happens in three stages. The first is called silent autoimmunity and there's antibodies present. So that's a sign that your body's attacking or has flagged some, some part of your body, your immune system rather has flagged some part of your body, but it's silent. There's no symptoms. There's no problems. There's no really issues yet. But those are also called predictive antibodies, too. And then stage two is you get symptoms. But maybe you don't have, let's say, like on an MRI, you don't have any lesions on your MRI, so you don't have MS. Or on an X-ray, let's say you're you know, 25 years old and you don't have joint erosion. but you, So you might not classify as rheumatoid arthritis or things like that. So there's no damage visible yet. And then the third is when there's visible irreversible tissue damage. So I think that that process and understanding that process and just knowing that, I mean, really like most health conditions have an autoimmune component to them. A lot of people might never be diagnosed with, with MS or Hashimoto's or rheumatoid arthritis or whatever the case is. But if you learn how to just control that mechanism of autoimmunity, it's the root of most, most ailments. I think this is a great segue to lab work because what it's the perfect way to kind of catch these things in its track. I mean, we're seeing this massive uptick in autoimmunity across the board and lab work seems to be one of those things that if you start doing it consistently early on, you can kind of stop these things in, in its tracks. Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, just a lot of even my work just in general, it's not strictly based on budget, but it's like, what are you willing to dive into? Because you can, the, the, the limit does not exist on how deep and how often you want to go on labs, but also what's the best bang for the buck. So looking at just general blood work and having somebody, you know, whether it's a MD or DC, or I don't know, even some health coaches that just know how to interpret this lab. They're not diagnosing and they're not offering treatment, but they're just helping you interpret your labs and, and in functional ranges. A lot of times just the basics go a long way. In fact, I got this sheet here. I know that if you're on audio, you won't be able to see it, but this just has different labs that we check off for people. And next to it, it has the cost of each one from our internal standpoint, just because as I'm checking something off, I keep that in mind of just what's the total cost and what's the bang for the buck of what we're really looking for and is it going to influence our action steps you know a lot of people they'll run like big fancy lab panels and the action steps are still kind of the same as if you ran you know more of a simple panel um but also so all, you can go again limitless with that ryan and and then also like even i could see in my background this book is called food associated autoimmunities it's a textbook and it's just like food sensitivities are a major driver of autoimmunity. It's not my favorite test. It's not the one that I always recommend for people, but food and food elimination is an important part of healing or, or reversing or whatever the word is, preventing the progression of autoimmunity or putting it into remission or kind of slowing down that process. Um, so anyway, you could do food testing, you could do gut testing. Now you said you've had some, some issues that you've worked on and you said through some labs and protocols and things, 
what testing have you had any experience with? Oh, so I love this world of testing. Um, but I would say on that topic of food sensitivity, I did um, early on in the journey, I did a MRT uh, 170 uh-huh. um, a food sensitivity test. And I it was really, really helpful at the time because doing a strict elimination diet, I was in college at the time, it was it was a little difficult sure. but to have that more targeted approach of knowing I mean, I know it's not a perfect science, but having just a general direction of what some of the things are that could be causing uh, major inflammation for you yeah. uh, was a really good guiding light just like early on to start to heal the gut and to allow the body to not create this massive um, inflammation spike through the things I eat. Yeah. And I think that you said it too, that it's not it's not a perfect science. There's different ways to test, but it can give you some short-term answers as far as like, hey, you need exactly. to cut this out for the next three months or so. Let me turn this off. How do I do this? Um, but I always draw, make a drawing for people too. And I say, if they focus on healing, as the healing goes up, the restrictions can come down. And food sensitivities yes. naturally change and they decrease with gut permeability and some of the other work that even you said that you've done. And so I think it's just, a, like you said, a short-term focus, but can identify some of those triggers of inflammation. I always say too, you know, in the conventional doctor's office, they say, hey, it's just inflammation. And that's kind of where they stop. And in my office, we say, hey, it's inflammation. And that's kind of where we start. So when we're looking for the drivers of, of inflammation, and, and another thing too, Ryan, just with this big picture autoimmune thing, I took this from one of my mentors, Dr. Sam Yannick, but he says, if you're scratching your hand, and you keep scratching, it's gonna get irritated and bleed and eventually there's gonna be tissue damage. So what you gotta do is stop scratching. So the fingers are foods and gut health, toxins, stress, hormones, and hidden infections. And so not in that, not in any particular order, but that kind of is really the order that I tend to look at these things in. Um, and so I think that just looking for the drivers of this inflammatory process and foods being a, a major one. Absolutely. So yeah, I love what you said. Restrictions go down once you start to heal. Like that is such an important note. I remember like being in the thick of being incredibly restrictive and being like, I, I don't want to do this for my whole life. But now in hindsight, I realize exactly what you just said that like, I don't really need to be restrictive with my diet anymore because i've done that healing in the past i think it's just such an important note for people and, who are like and, in the thick of it yeah and it's a balance too because let's say you spend six months like off the wagon a little bit more and then it's like okay well problems can reappear and then it's like okay i gotta refocus on the healing aspect and the restriction aspect and so i think that even for me as i you know get older year by year it's more of that balance of of like okay well if you I don't know if you get off track, then that's okay, but get back on track. And I think that a lot of times so many people come into me and they're so hyper-focused on like the right now because they're in pain or they're suffering or they're struggling. And I think the big picture long-term, you're always playing with that balance, um, recovery and uh, from, from anything, you know, from exercise, from drinking, from <laughs> food, from vacation, from stress, you have to balance it out with some, you know, recovery time. Totally. So you said... Food, gut, hidden infections, toxins. Am I missing one there? Stress. Uh, I think um, I said, yeah, stress. So food and gut, I, put, I combine those into one. Um, gotcha. And hidden infections, I would say, is a little bit different, which could be gut, of course, but just as far as even lab work, but gut and foods, toxins, stress. I usually, even as I'm listing them, I list those two interchangeably, but I always say hormones, hormones. and hidden infections. The hormones one, especially in women, autoimmunity is more prevalent in women. And it really tends to hit around puberty, pregnancy, and perimenopause. So all three just times of, of more hormonal fluctuations and hormonal changes. So why is that? It's because of that hormone fluctuations? That Exa yeah, yeah. So, and some protective roles and some inflammatory roles and things like that, like even in, in menopauses inflammation uh or as estrogen declines there's a big inflammatory cytokine trigger and so that can just drive a lot of inflammatory like inflammatory loops that kind of get activated and keep going same thing with pregnancy pregnancy is like 
the body's preparing the baby for the outside world. And then as soon as the baby's out, it's like, we could take a break. And there's different charts that I'll even show people as far as like your immune system goes through different polarizations in each trimester. So I, I do a lot of visual stuff with people, you know, whether it's virtual or in person, if it's virtual or either way, I just flip my computer around, but I've got a bunch of graphics from science literature and medical studies and stuff. And they just really quickly can illustrate like, Hey, these cytokines change in each trimester. So some people might say, Hey, my allergies were way worse in the second trimester. And we can show that in a picture, but it's a lot of this T cell polarization, which is, I think important in the world of autoimmunity. Because T cells are kind of what do what do the damage um, in the autoimmune world, but the immune system goes through these certain fluctuations, and then a lot, just a lot of people, they might say like, after my first kid, I was tired. After my second kid, I was really tired. After my third kid, I felt like I got hit by a bus and I couldn't get out of bed, or I couldn't pick my baby up because I had rheumatoid arthritis or things like that. So it will it will progress through different pregnancies sometimes. But that's just one of the clues, even on paperwork, of maybe you have an autoimmune process occurring. Yeah. And you mentioned T cells there being a big part of this response. Oh, yeah. And um, that's love one of the reasons why I've been, let's dive into it. But in particular <laughs> with peptides, um, I've been yeah, I don't know as much about that. With... I've, I've had a few questions about that recently. And I don't, you know, BPC 157, of course, being like the most famous peptide, but I don't, I don't know that much about different uh, T cell stimulating ones. I just started listening to this dude. I maybe listen to like maybe one or two podcasts, but he's kind of in the mold and lime world and he's mm. just huge into peptides. I don't even remember his name, but um, it was super intriguing because it was all about T cells. So even may, you might be able to educate me on some, some peptide stuff. Yeah. I don't know a ton. I know you, I, um, I, I, I have not done it yet. I, I, I've been interested in uh, thymosin alpha one and um, yeah. thymosin or uh, thymosin beta one or thymosin another, beta four. Thymosin yeah, beta there's four. another thymo, thym, thymus one. Those are the ones that I've heard about. And, and yeah. I, I would only recognize them when you said them, but uh, I don't even know, understand like the nomenclature and the naming. So I'm, I just, not very well versed on, on peptides. There's a couple of guys I follow that are just huge into it, but I think the the reviews that I've heard from people that have done it are have been mixed, I would say. And I, oh, I've right. seen one person who he blamed his autoimmunity on BPC-157. That's kind of what he thought was the trigger. I have no way of confirming that, but that's just what he, he kind of suspected had caused him to flare in whatever capacity. Um, but that's the only bad thing I've ever heard. And then I've also just heard maybe like that when people stop, their results have kind of stopped. And, and I don't remember if that's even with immune things or if that's with um, um, like SARMs or different testosterone, uh, different modulating things. Um, but I have, have heard that as well. So I don't know. I just haven't dabbled in that. Another thing for me, though, too, is I don't want to say, say that I'm like super cheap because, I mean, I'm, I definitely drop some coin into my wellness. But. I'm bang for the buck. So I'm more like food, diet, exercise, light, air quality. I'm huge into totally. air quality. So I'd rather drop like a couple grand on air purification stuff for my house than on, on different things like that. Now, I'm not opposed to it in hyperbaric. And, and I think that all those things have value. But also some of those things, even for me, you know, my old practice was in Salt Lake and I did cryo and I, there was just access to that stuff. So now I'm in Peoria, Illinois or Washington, Illinois. And it's more like small town. I mean, it's not, there's 300,000 people, but it's not like hyperbaric. Except there's not that much hyperbaric. There's not that much. I don't know if there's any cryo. There's like salt tanks and stuff like that. But there's just not a lot of these modalities, even to get like a Myers cocktail or IV vitamins. It would be, there's like maybe a few clinics that would offer it, but it's not, uh, they're not readily accessible. So, and I don't even know around here. I mean, I know you can order peptides online, but. I don't even know if there's anybody practitioner wise to even guide me around here. Yeah. So, I mean, it's difficult. It's definitely it, yeah. difficult. That was my hesitation for it because I wanted to uh, do it with a practitioner who like was very well versed and understanding. And I had a few conversations with people, but like, they're just kind of like, yeah, take these two. 
and I, I didn't really have too much guidance with it. So, yeah. Um, and I also think like to your point, right? Like we step over dollars for pennies a lot in this world of health. Like yes. it's, I, I was talking about this the other day with somebody. It's like, there's two people arguing about whether diet Coke is the worst thing in the world, but yet when you look at like the things that are killing people, it's going to be insulin resistance, like being one of the main things. And it's like, you are overweight, inflamed, and you're worrying too much about diet Coke. Like, yeah, get in shape. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. There, there's yeah. so much the of this. focus on the basics. And that's why I feel about air quality as well. Just going back to that. But like, I completely agree. And I think that as I've gotten older in this profession, you know, I think I, I gotta even look up at my, diploma sometimes uh, I, i'm almost 12 years out of school so i mean not not i don't feel super old but i definitely feel a lot older than i than i did then but each year you know i feel like and even having kids too like just moderation to some degree now there's a line somewhere and you don't really want to flirt with that line but to be all or nothing in a lot of these areas is just not that sustainable but i feel like the 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 basics of gut health uh stress toxins i mean the five scratchers basically that's kind of why too you know i spoke i've spoken before at different uh seminars about my practice and i said that's why i picked the niche of autoimmunity because it's kind of like the anti-niche it's like keep all these plates spinning and look into what somebody's priorities might be so even based on questionnaires and things like that that's what's going to lead me towards gut testing or foods testing or toxin testing or hormone testing so a lot of times you can fish out some of these clues through a lot of people's history and questionnaires and then just say, hey, this is what I think is the best thing for you to test. And a lot of what I do too, like there's this huge world of like options that are all great and they all have got, you know, fancy price tags and fancy landing pages and, you know, very, 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 very tempting. And when you read it, it's like, I need that, I need that, I need that, I need oh, it yeah. all. <laughs> so one of the things that I do is just guide people and say, hey, this is why I would, would recommend this over this and i tell people you know my opinion is not golden like do whatever you want a lot of people i see are working with multiple practitioners they've seen you know or they've been to 15 or 20 or things like that that's not uncommon in my practice um but anyway i just help guide people more so than give any diagnosis or treatment um because there's just so many options out there there's so many options out there and i mean it is the beauty of the internet though right like do you work um, uh, like telemedicine across yeah. states? Yeah, yeah, it's not telemedicine because it's more just consulting. Um, okay. But absolutely, I work virtually. I have international all all across the the country mostly, but I also have international clients and stuff. I mean, it's so it's like the beauty of the internet, though, right? Like in not too long ago, you were you were almost forced to go to that doctor in your town. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of times th those guys aren't the, the best ones for you. And like the internet opens up this world where you can consult uh, with people all over. Exactly. I just had somebody tell me that from Dubai. And she was like, that was the beauty of COVID is that now I can meet with somebody like you talking to me and say, hey, this, now, now I'm able to find you and connect with you. It's like, yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. So and I always tell people too, I tell my international clients, I'm like, hey, I just think it's cool that we're able to connect. Like I'm still humbled by it. And like, it's just like, this is cool that you found me and, and we're working together, but uh, I have that happen, you, you know, pretty often. So it's cool. So do you do like, if someone gets labs done and they're like, well, how do I read this? Uh, like, do you, do you do that with people where yeah, people can a lot, see you to interpret? Yeah. A lot of people that come to me have like, you know, folder of, of labs that they've done. Um, and, and, you know, some come to me with, with nothing, they've done nothing and they're kind of started from scratch, but uh, a lot of people come to me with like a box full of supplements and a folder full of labs and they've worked with a couple of practitioners and maybe they've hit some roadblocks or maybe they, uh, I don't know, just want to change a pace or sometimes, sometimes a, a second opinion, you know, they're working with their, their chiropractors ordered them three labs and they're just kind of hit the end of their road and said, what should we do next? Um, but yeah, that's pretty common. So let's dive into the food stuff. So like for someone who um, suspects that they have some heavy food sensitivities, uh, what do you think that person should do? Um, 
first get a practitioner, I would say, because I think that they could just save them a lot of time because exactly. a lot of times, even if people are reacting to foods, that doesn't mean that a food sensitivity test is even their best option or their best bet. I think that if there's one test to do, it's stool testing and just seeing like the, the health of the gut, like we said about just focus on the healing. But like I a think GI that, effects, is that the one? That's a testing? great one. Yeah, I do a GI map. Uh, there's also gut zoomers. Um, I also do an organic acid, which is a urine test, but it looks into some gut gut metabolites. That's one of my, one of my favorite, probably my favorite lab. Mm. Uh, organic acids is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's 76, like I did this one from Mosaic or Great Plains. It used to be Great Plains. Um, there's 76 different markers on there. Looks at yeast and mold overgrowth in the gut, some bacterial imbalances in the gut with well, their urine metabolites. So it's not a direct stool test, um, but shows these metabolites that can really, really, really jack up neurotransmitters and brain health. Um, so it looks at some just really intriguing things in the gut. So I, my favorite two tests are the stool test and the O test together. Um, it's a little more sensitive for yeast than, than most stool tests. So it looks for yeast metabolites in kind of a different way, yeast and mold. And then it also looks at mitochondrial markers. And I always tell people too, it's like, if you've had blood labs and it's like, everything looks good, then this is kind of the next layer deeper and more, some more cellular mechanics. So it looks at oxalates, looks at mitochondrial markers, looks at neurotransmitter imbalances, looks at detoxability, B vitamin markers. So just some really cool things. So I think combining that with a stool test is my favorite too, like, baseline test a lot of people come to me with with both of those two labs already done i'd say it's one of the more common tests that people come to me with too um but yeah so i think that going back to the foods i think that there's so first off it depends on what the food sensitivities are so my answer is probably pretty complex just because i would be asking them a lot about the foods that they react to so a lot of times i'll draw like if we're on zoom i'll draw on a whiteboard and say uh, tell me how you'd feel with each of these foods, bread and pasta, uh, fried foods, ice cream, um, in, uh, in, in my li tomatoes, spicy foods, salsa. I might list out just a few foods and I, it, with each one, I'm just kind of looking for clues or a big raw salad. Let's say I'll, those are like the six maybe. And so with each one, I'm looking for clues. If they're like, oh, big raw salad, I'm immediately bloated then I'm probably not looking on a food sensitivity test. I'm probably looking more into FODMAPs or just sending them some resources on FODMAPs and saying, hey, my suspicion is that we're going to find overgrowth on your labs, but let's see what, what we find. So I always say, too, in the gut, sometimes we need to pull weeds in the gut. Sometimes you need to plant seeds in the gut with probiotics. And more often than not, people are planting seeds when they should be pulling weeds, I would say, when you look at their, their lab work. Um, the fried foods might be leading me more towards like gallbladder and, and maybe some just parts of the digestive process. If they have an inability to digest fats, they get floating stools, they get, have any skin issues, hormonal issues. Um, the gluten one makes me think of just gluten, which is super common, but a lot of people too say like after a while with the healing part, they say like, I can have a little bit of gluten now and I feel fine. But if I have it a few meals a day, like, oh my gosh, I'll never do that again. Or at some point there's a tolerance level, but their tolerance for it has improved. Um, the ice cream is a common one. So it's then it's like, is it dairy? Is it dairy plus sugar? A lot of people aren't reactive, like from a symptom standpoint to like a little cheese on their salad. But if they eat a tub of ice cream, they're going to like crap their pants. Um, so just asking them through each one of those symptoms I've had, uh, you know, I've had that, that story before is one of my favorite stories is somebody said, you know, I won't make your podcast explicit, but they said, can't have ice cream. And I was like, oh yeah, why not? She's like, crap myself. Uh, but she said it in a different way, you know, uh, it was like, okay, well that, that's a good, a good sign. And I've heard that from many people, but just asking them through their different food sensitivities. Some of the ones that are a little harder to find are, uh, oxalates. So oxalates we can find on labs that can be on an O test, um, which come from really, really, really healthy foods. And so that's an interesting thing that we could talk about. Or histamine is just like, I would say in the last five, four years, you know, like COVID era, basically, uh, histamine is just massively, massively rising to the surface of maybe just recognition, but also I think of prevalence because of different COVID related issues. Um, 
so yeah, even a lot of like long COVID is like, you know, in the long COVID forums and things, you'll find a lot of histamine and low histamine diets and like newfound histamine reactions. Um, so I think that that's an important thing to look at. But a, a lot of those, again, you're not going to find on a food sensitivity test. You might on an MRT. I don't do MRT testing, but I think that you might just because it's looking for that immune response. Um, but I think that asking people through and just talking through is my my most important step. What was the uh, food sensitivity test you use? I use Cyrex. Yeah. Is yeah. there any reason for that? I feel like I'm hearing more and more people. Choose well, Cyrex Cy the, the founder of Cyrex, Dr. Vigidani, this the clinical director of Cyrex, he, he, found, he started food sensitivity testing like in the 80s. Mm. He was the first one ever to, he's the one that authored this textbook and his son wrote, wrote this book. His son's more, his son's an MD. So his son's more of a practitioner. You can see my light. Uh, right. But it says when food bites back, and that's more of the lay person's version. And this is more of the practice. It's a textbook, so it's it's expensive, it's thick, and it's just like all the science, but it's super cool. But that's just kind of why. Um, yeah, you know, I always say too is like Ford says they're better than Chevy says they're better than Toyota, and they're all pretty good. They're all about the same. You got to test drive them and feel feel which one's right for you, but. Uh, they're all pretty good as far as lab testing. I, I do think that with food sensitivity, I think some are better than others. Cyre well, some of Cyrex's claims also is they use raw and cooked food antigens. So when the food is cooked, the, the uh, molecular structure of it changes. And so they use raw and cooked because some foods aren't really eaten raw. Um, so I think that that's an interesting thing. Um, but yeah, that's, just, I've always just stuck with Cyrus. I've done others. I've done some finger prick ones and stuff. I wasn't really happy with the, just the, the results. I just felt like a lot of them came back clean. Um, which I, not to say that these kids and people didn't have, but I, you want to do labs that people get value from. So a clean test provides no action steps and no answer. So if I start doing a couple tests that are clean, then I'm probably not going to keep running that test for very long. Because not to say we're looking for problems, but I mean, that's what people come to me for is to look for their problems of what could be driving their inflammation. So anyway, that's my, my preferred lab test. So oxalates is one that freaks people out because they have this idea that like spinach and almonds and all these things are like superfoods. And for right. a lot of times they're, uh, they aren't that for people. Yeah, I think that that concept is becoming more prevalent in different categories too, like with lectins and Dr. Gundry, yeah. just, he really pushed that to the forefront. But once he started saying that, like the plants have defense mechanisms and they don't want to be eaten and things like that, it's like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. And I feel mm -hmm. like also, you know, carnivore has just been very, very popular, but I feel like a lot of people, they got issues with histamines. They got issues with FODMAPs, they got issues with lectins, they got issues with oxalates. And then all those are just from the plant kingdom. So I think that that's where the value has been for a lot of people in carnivore. Now, I'm just still kind of like a moderate of like not all plants, not all animals, but but a little bit of both. Um, but I do think that either one go in either direction for a period of time can just shift the microbiome too. So I think that's that's part of the focus of whatever your dietary strategy is, is like, you don't want to be on that forever. And, and you might always have some limitations on your diet. But uh, as you focus on that healing, it's more like what's going to shift my microbiome in the direction that I want it to. Um, so if it might be avoiding FODMAPs for a period of time or avoiding sugar for an antifungal diet, that's another just huge, huge, huge one that not only helps from a metabolic standpoint, as far as carbs and fat and things like that but helps start or uh, yeah, starve off candida or yeast. Yeast has a receptor on its membrane that when it's, it's a sugar receptor and it turns it from the like dormant form into the hyphal form, which is like planting roots. And so its roots can extend up to three feet in the body, which is insane. Um, so that's where sugar comes in as far as feeding yeast, but that's just a really, really common thing that I see too as an underlying driver. It's probably even in the world of autoimmunity, like the world of Hashimoto's, let's say I see a lot of Hashimoto's, it's it's for sure the single most common thing I see in Hashimoto's patients. If you do a gut test and a yeast test and just with like what helps them more, antifungal stuff really, really 
helps people to reduce their fungal burden. And I'm also a huge, huge mold guy. So we could talk about, about mold for as long as we have available today. But I would say that yeast, you know, it's not always mold in your basement or mold in your bathroom or mold in your crawl space. Sometimes it's mold in your sinuses or mold in your gut. But I think that all of those things just contribute to fungal burden. And all, all together, I would say fungal burden, I would say is a major driver of most symptoms, autoimmunity and otherwise. So speaking of mold and carnivore and these things, um, have you seen Jordan Peterson's daughter? So she does, she has oh, yeah. very bad autoimmune issues. Uh, she's on a strict carnivore diet. It solved her issues that she had for all of her life. Uh, but she made some posts recently. I don't know if you saw this about um, her finding out that she had mold, um, very mad mold. And that's just an interesting connection there. I want to try to pull it I mean, I'm, what you said about it. I'm not the least shocked. I mean, I think that if most people look, not to say that they all have it, but especially if you've got some kind of autoimmune presentation, it is really, really common and, and uh, mold and mycotoxins are known as the master antigen. So they just stimulate massive immune response. And there's just a lot of things that fall under the category of fungal burden. So you can have mold colonization, which is it living inside your body, inside your gut, inside your lungs, inside your sinus, uh, vaginal yeast infections, et cetera. Or you can have mycotoxins from mold, which is what a lot of people are talking about when we talk about mold toxicity. So one of those is killed with antifungals, you know, from a pharmaceutical standpoint, Nystatin, fluconazole, from an herbal standpoint, herbal antifungals, whatever, but you're trying to kill mold or, or yeast living inside your body. The other one is, it, is mold toxins. And so you get mold toxins that accumulate. And, and it says in the literature, they accumulate for a lifetime, they could have an indefinite existence and they accumulate in the cells and they just drive massive disruption of things, neuroinflammation, neuroexcitation, a lot of brain-based things. Cause it's diagnosed. There's a, a mold camp that diagnoses it as chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is a brain-based mechanism. But anyway, they just wreak havoc and I could go on and on. I've got just a, dozens and dozens, hundreds of studies, probably hundreds, um, all explaining this. So I show just people the pictures. I've got videos on YouTube just talking about it. And it's become, a, it's, a, it's a hot thing in, in functional medicine, especially. But the other thing with that too, right, I would say it's just like breathing clean air. You know, it's not always mold. My office had formaldehyde for two years and I knew that something was making me not, it wasn't even sick. I wouldn't even say sick. It's making my nose run more than anything. And every time I'd ozone in my office, it would go away. And then like two weeks later, my nose would be running by Friday after I'd been in my office all week. And it took me two years, but I got a formaldehyde meter and that's what it was. But I'm just a huge believer of breathing clean air and like ionizers and air purifiers. And so we talk about that. And I think that again, it's one of those things that there's different camps that say, well, you can't do this and you can't do this and you got to do it this way and you got to do it this way. And I'm more of the belief of like, well, each one of you is probably right in your own regard. So how, what's the right situation for the person that I'm talking to? So we teach people even like how to use things like foggers or, or ozoners or air purifiers or ionizers or whatever, air scrubbers. We have them in our office too. We rent them out to people here locally. So I'm just a huge fan of breathing clean air, whether it's dust or pesticides or whatever the case is. So how do you, when, um, how do you one diagnose somebody with mold? Like what type of tests do you like? Is that like a total, I think it's like total burden or total tox you, or something can, like that is the good one. You all, I don't know. There is a, there's a couple total tox ones that usually look at a lot of chemicals and, and things. There might be a one comprehensive toxin panel, but it's usually your urine mycotoxins is what I use or an O test or antibodies. I don't do the mycotoxin antibodies. Some people do, um, but I do urine mycotoxins. And I'd say that's mm -hmm. what most people in the profession use is urine mycotoxins. Now there's like a lot of other tests. There's a lot of controversy about it of like, some food-based mycotoxins, but generally 
what we see is that people that are excreting more mycotoxins, they have more. And one of the guys that I like, and you should seriously check this out. I mean, I would recommend it for anybody. Um, it's a YouTube video. It's from a seminar that I was at. It was for doctors, but it's on the company that, of the guy that they're interviewing. He's an ENT surgeon. They put it on their YouTube channel. Um, so their YouTube channel is called Microbalance. Microbalance Health Products, I think, Microbalance. Um, and anyway, he talks about he's an ENT surgeon. And he says, if somebody's excreting like two mycotoxins on their urine test, they might have 11 of them in their pituitary. He said, it's a toxic soup up there. It's not like it's just one or the other. Sometimes what we're excreting isn't a direct reflection of everything that's in there. But airborne toxins especially have a direct access up the olfactory nerve right to the brain and then they can store in those areas. And then for a lot of people, it's, let's say it's the, let's say that I would say it's deep midline areas of the brain. So let's say it's the amygdala. Well, that's going to be anxiety and panic. That's the fear sensing area. And let's say it's the pituitary. Well, then that's going to be hormone fluctuations or frequent urination. You know, one time I had this kid, I just mentioned this on another podcast. Um, I had this kid who was drinking 500 ounces of water a day. I was like, that's mold. And they tested their house and there's mold all over. Um, so that's pituitary. For some people, it's going to be more, I don't know, basal ganglia, and they're going to have more OCD, ticks, different things. But it's all this inflammatory processes in these deep midline areas of the brain from airborne toxins. And to his point, we can't really measure what all's up there. But if we're excreting some mycotoxins, it's a sign that we've got at least some in our body. And then going and looking through testing or looking through where's the exposure. You know, I've had people with I had somebody this summer with MS test her work and quit her job after finding massively high levels of mycotoxins at her work. Um, and so just different things like that. But uh, I'd use a urine mycotoxin test. But I like to layer the testing, too, because, again, what you want to confirm or, or have some strong suspicions for is do they have colonization or do they have mycotoxins? And then you go and look for sourcing or is it from your old house that you lived in five years ago is it currently and so not jumping to dropping 10k on like testing your whole house but just talking through a lot of these things is how we kind of figure out appropriate next steps and saying okay well where do we think it could be coming from now versus past and then looking into other exposures too uh you know i've had somebody recently who they th his wife has sinus issues so mold was on our radar for that. And so we were looking and they did some mold plates, which is like the most inexpensive way to test, but their mold plates looked really nasty. So they sent it off to a lab and then they had a mold testing person come and, and test and then they got it remediated and blah, blah, blah. But the husband, he reacts more, we're finding now to chemicals. He's been around pesticides and had these reactions, these autoimmune reactions. He has Hashimoto's. He, he was diagnosed with Graves. But it was, I think, a misdiagnosis, and he really has Hashimoto's. But anyway, he reacts around chemicals. So he's like, I get it around in a new car. I get it around a chlorinated pool. I get it around, what was, there's was another one recently, it was just like airborne toxins cause him to flare and react. So anyway, I think that just breathing clean air, I forgot even what the question was. Now, right? I just rambled about mold stuff, but I love breathing it. clean air is for one of the drivers, I would say. And I would say too, just tying back to our whole conversation, foods are the obvious one. So that's where a lot of people reach where I said like, you know, the healing has to reach a certain level before the restrictions come down. Mold drives food sensitivities. So it can drive increased permeability and increased food sensitivities. And so it can drive other reactivities so i think that foods is an easy thing to check off as a first thing but it's not often the only thing and so i often see people after they've kind of gone through that that you know freshman year of of autoimmunity and they're moving on to some of the the higher level stuff i love that you brought the conversation to mental health because it's one it's such a loaded topic but it's crazy. People have this perception of their mental health issues as uh, genetic or a imbalance in their neurotransmitters or something that they can do nothing about or that the only solution is an SSRI or whatever it may be. 
and bringing the conversation more towards this holistic functional medicine type of approach is uh it's fascinating it's a fascinating it, world it absolutely is because i think that even the more you look into it it's like how you can't you can't possibly address it without it i'm looking to see i don't have it because i've told you I'm, I'm on my new computer i'm trying to switch over desktop stuff but i've got a paper on my computer that just says mold inhalation causes innate immune system activation and mood and behavioral brain imbalances and you know when you look at just some of the 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 studies that i show people i, I you can illustrate that pretty quickly that there's a direct connection i just did an interview on my podcast that's not even out yet with this guy who's a pediatrician and the topic was mold mycotoxins and mental health in kids um, and he he just said like 10 years ago this got on his radar and now it's now he realizes like every person he sees with different behavioral imbalances adhd ocd depression etc it's got to at least be screened or ruled out and i've heard that said from like dale bredesen who's the top alzheimer's expert in the country he's out of ucla um i've heard him say the same thing about mycotoxins and alzheimer's he speaks on that pretty pretty commonly and not to say it's the only thing but he says it's a hidden epidemic of these airborne toxins driving these neuro imbal or yeah neuro imbalances let's say that can lead to neurodegeneration Whew. i mean we're seeing this huge uptick in autoimmunity we, we started the podcast on and talking about it but it's if you look at the graphs it's going up exponentially and you know you have some people blaming seed oils and whatever it may be um but it just seems like it's this thing of we're getting attacked in every which direction um and it, well i think the bucket the bucket theory really summarizes a lot of it of like because it's the seed oils it's the you know glyphosate that's sprayed on the plants it's the airborne pollution and it's just all those things and uh, that just continually fill the bucket and not to say that any one of those is like the you know going to blame anyone for causation you're never going to be able to put a finger on it but it's this cumulative effect that these are just all stressors on the body and so as you just put more and more stress on the body then sometimes there's one straw that breaks the camel's back but there's no real needle in the haystack it's just all those things together so what should we be doing like as a whole as people in general, if you're dealing with autoimmune diseases or not, to prevent yourself from getting attacked by all these hidden stressors that we have? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and first off, you know, again, I hate to say that I have a, a, all the right answers, but I just think in general, it, that word stress of like, how can you decrease the stress response or chronic stress response? And that doesn't mean like, you know, go go live in Bali as a Buddhist monk or something on the beach, which probably wouldn't be too bad, but it just means like, how can you decrease all the external stress or internal stress in your body? There's mental and emotional stress. So just as far as like, I mean, there's a million ways to, to work on that as far as prayer, meditation, a faith-based practice, exercise. And I'm saying outside of supplements, because I think that supplements become after some of these foundational things. But I think it's uh, stress from a mental and emotional standpoint. And I'm happy to dive into any of those things further. Even we in our office do neurofeedback. There's different things. Like I've got a thing over here I could show you that's cool. It's, uh, it's audio visual entrainment. It's headphones and glasses, flashing lights that entrains your brain to certain wavelengths. So I'm super into all those gadgets and things for the brain. But even in heart math, there's just another easier one. Um, more accessible and less expensive and things like that. But I, I, again, I don't want to step over pennies for dollars or whatever it is, but maybe I said it backwards, but uh, I think that some of those basics, but for mental health, then I think physical health, you know, exercise, I, you know, right now I'm sitting, but I just got a standing desk because I don't like sitting too much and, you know, just not being sedentary, not overtraining. Also, I see you go both directions. Um, but exercise is just a great way of just minimizing stress and keeping healthy in, in every single regard. Um, and I'll tell you too, my four most important like lifestyle things in a second, but then also toxic stress of, well, what do you need to focus on? And I'm also a fan of like micro cycles, macro cycles of spend three months focusing on your gut 
And that might be like a better diet and things like that. And then you might spend three months focus, focusing on your, your physical aspect. And that doesn't mean that you're not working out for the three months of gut focus, but it might not be your focus. And just if you look at like, you know, the life wheel or things like that, that people draw, it's like just shifting those focuses for micro cycles and macro cycles, depending on what your goal is. So if your goal is stress or mental health, spend a month doing that or whatever, whatever period of time it is. But so those three things, mental and emotional health, physical, physical stress and toxic stress. So that might be detoxing or doing lab testing or saying, now I'm going to go look at a mold. I'm going to spend three months focusing on this or whatever the case is. Um, another thing that I say, and again, just combining some of these principles or thoughts, but just life or, or environment, 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 I, I, I have something I'm trying to picture it. I usually draw things. I'm very visual, but it's four most important lifestyle inputs. And I think the food is the last one, but I still think it's important. But I think that first is the air quality. Again, I'm huge, just huge on that. I've just seen it cause so many things. I think next is the light and circadian rhythms. I'm big on that, big on the early morning sunlight, big on usually I have blue black and glasses, infrared sauna, you know, all those things and gadgets and stuff like that. I've got a I've got an infrared light or a red light sitting right over there too. So we got all this stuff like literally like right at my fingertips. I got a tens device sitting over here for Vegas nerve stimulation. It's just like oh I'm jealous. My yeah. office just needs jealous. cleaned up more than anything. Um and it's sitting on my Austin air purifier. So we got just stuff all over the place. Um but Air quality, light quality, then exercise, then diet, in my opinion. I think you can out-exercise a bad diet in many regards. You know, my grandpa, who's 96 or something, he, he his his diet has not been perfect. It's still not, but he's always exercised and moved. And uh, I do think you can out-exercise some things diet-wise. Um, but I think that the light is the overlooked one, and I think that the air is the most overlooked one. Um, yeah. I love those. I actually love that order because I mean, I, I, I think most people like the person who's not well versed in this world will probably have those things flipped. Um, right. Yeah. But if you are the person who's in the thick of it, you start to realize that that's true. Like, yeah. I, cause if you, cause if you've got the air and the light and exercise figured out, then you don't have to be nearly as restrictive on your diet exactly. as far as uh, even on labs and symptoms, certainly, but those restrictions come down. And not to say, I like to tell people that I want you to be avoiding foods because you think you should, not because you have to. You know, and most people come to me and they have to eat this super restrictive diet and they can't touch this and they can't touch that. Um, so yeah, I just think that making those better choices because you want to but avoiding things like gluten, dairy, sugar, whatever the case is. Yeah. So detoxing. I, I'm yeah. fascinated by this because we look at all the stuff we talked about today from whether it's mold or just these toxins in general. Um, it seems like the sauna is an incredible way to detox, but outside yeah. of the sauna, uh, what are some things that, that you think are some major keys for um, actively detoxing? And should this be something that we are constantly doing or is this things that we should be cycling uh i think a little bit of both you know i think that you're never you're never not detoxing but maybe like i said micro macro cycles maybe a little more aggressive focus on it for a period of time and i'm a fan of like if you're gonna go at it go hard at it and stack the scale in your favor so maybe for you know 60 to 90 days taking binders glutathione binders and glutathione are probably the top two supplements for detox and binders, um, you're meaning like charcoal? Yeah, charcoal, humic and fulvic acids are very popular and trendy. And, so and that would be like also. shilajit? Shilajit, yeah. I don't know as, nearly as much about shilajit, but yeah, it is a binder. But also humic and fulvics, like, uh, I think, they're just, I mean, they're usually just called humic and fulvic acid, but like cell wow, core, okay. cell core uh, binders are very famous for parasites, mold, um, heavy metals. And I like doing blends too, Ryan. So like, and I also like, I might have people cycle their binders because different binders have different affinities for different toxins. So I might have people take a blend that has charcoal, shilajit, zeolite, bentonite clay. And, and this might just be, you know, take two a day or take four a day or whatever. And then when that bottle's done, let's switch to a different one just to bind other toxins in a different way. But 
doing talk, doing binders. Now, I think there are some concerns with with long term binders. Um, they do they can bind minerals and things like that. But I think that keeping an eye on things. But I I, I don't think that again even even in the mold world, you know, a lot of times you'll hear scary numbers like it takes five years to get better, which I I I don't disagree with in some cases. It kind of depends on what you define as better, but um doing it for periods of time i also do a lot of binders as i'm doing gut protocols so as we're killing things mm. in the gut we want to bind that dye off or bind lps which is a major driver of autoimmunity and inflammation so i'll often do binders for like you know the first three to six months of somebody even if we're I, a lot of times just in general i i don't follow like any cookie cutter protocol but i would generally start with the gut and so we might be doing binders as part of a gut protocol, and then we might shift the focus more to detox, but binders are a good thing to stay on. The mechanism of binders too is interesting because this also explains some of the other supplements and other strategies, but so the liver takes toxins, breaks them down in, in what's phase one and phase two detox. And so that's important. And even when you're like interpreting genetics and things like that, you can see a lot of these things, but a lot of people I see they're they're like, life is a wreck but their genetics are like pretty good or, or vice versa. So genetics, I think is another flash in the pan thing that you could easily spend like several grand on genetic interpretation, or you could do like a 23 and me and, or whatever you want to use or, and run it through some software for 40 bucks or something and get a really detailed report of your methylation and other things. But anyway, phase do you have any one software, phase, uh, softwares what? that you recommend for that. I like, well, my favorite is Strategene, uh, Strategene from Ben Lynch. It's also, it's pretty heady. It's pretty nerdy. It's like, it shows a lot of the pathways, but I like Strategene. I also like Nutra Hackers free, like their detox and methylation report is free. So a lot of the genetics that we really care about are, are the detox genes and methylation genes. You know, I don't care so much about, do you have like, genes for better cognition or genes for longevity or things like that. They're, they're cool to know. Um, but I'd say my four favorites that I've used personally, strategy, Nutra hacker, uh, found my fitness round of Patrick's, uh, yep. software is really good. Round of Patrick's awesome. And I did self decode from, um, mm -hmm. uh, I forget his name, but, um, the self the self hacked guy joe yeah. uh yeah. Joe, yeah um so anyway what is it joe is it joe lucky is that his name i don't know i don't know that doesn't sound right i would i was just looking at the like yesterday joe like, cohen joe cohen that's what it yeah. is yeah yeah that's um, a good platform yeah he yeah and he's legit you know he kind of got into this game pretty early and made a huge name for himself and a huge business and, and really a smart smart dude but he got into it from healing his own stuff so it's a great it's a great you know system and you can print different reports and different cognitive reports or different detox reports or you different athletic performance reports yeah. so it, it kind of depends on what you want to dive into for those things but in the autoimmune functional wellness world i think that the detox genes are the most important they regulate things like methylation, the most famous detox process, glucuronidation, sulfation. Um, all those are just different processes by which toxins and, and neurotransmitters and hormones or things are what's called biotransformed. So the liver does a lot of that and takes these toxins and then puts them into bile. And bile is because that's the point of binders, too, is they're called bile binders. But then toxins are excreted, but bile is really expensive for the body to make. So the body reabsorbs bile. So if you've got thick, toxic, sludgy bile, then your body can be reabsorbing and recirculating toxins. You want to bind those toxins so you get them out and excrete them. And then your body uh, produces more bile. And, and so that's also a kind of a liver cleansing concept. Even like another you know supplement company that's great is uh, Quicksilver, and they've got a detox protocol but it's called push catch. So it's push toxins out of the liver and catch them in the, in the gut with binders. So I just think that even if you're not using their products, that whole concept is a lot of what you can do for detox. So let's say you're going through, you know, for 60 days, you're going to sauna three times a week and you're going to do a push catch detox protocol. Well, 
great. You're going to lower your toxic load for a macro cycle of 60 days or something like that. Um, and, and that's great. Now you can also do other liver supports as part of just that same concept. You can do lymphatic supports who just keep toxins moving out of the body is basically the whole point. So, and I always say too, there's only a few ways that your body gets rid of toxins. You poop them out, you pee them out, you breathe them out and you sweat them out. So that's where sauna comes in is like some of these, you don't really want to speed up too much. If somebody is constipated though, that's step number one for, for detox. If they've got to be moving things out of their body. So sometimes in a lot of even detox, you know, protocols, we'll start with kidney support, start with liver support, start with gut support, make sure that those doorways are open. But I always say with the sauna is like, what if you open up a fourth door? You know, what if you're in a basketball game and somebody pulls the fire alarm or something and only three doors are open, you open a fourth door, all of a sudden everybody can get out a little more efficiently. So sometimes that's the value of opening up one of those doors from a, from a detox standpoint. But I think that all those things, whatever supports those pathways, is what you can do for detox. So I mentioned glutathione, that's another great one. I mean, it could be argued that almost any supplement on the shelf like supports detox, you know, B vitamins are great, liver support is great. Anything that helps cellular mechanics is gonna help getting, keeping toxins out. I think that again, going back to the balance and the bucket is like, if you can balance that the outflow is more than the inflow, you're going to move in a healthier direction. And so that's a, increasing these excretion pathways, but also decreasing the exposure pathways at the same time. I'm going to hit you with a hard one here because so originally yeah. I was going to ask you, uh, what are the five supplements that you recommend most for the people you work with? But I think I want to extend that to 10 supplements that you ah. are the, uh, that you tend to find yourself recommending the most. Sure. I, I need to write them down because I was tell me where I'm at with number one. Okay. But, I'm going to be I'm gonna uh, writing them down. All right. Uh, I think that the first one is probably histamine stuff. And I'm saying histamine stuff because there's within that category, there's probably six or eight different things, but they all have histamine in the name. So most histamine mm. supports have quercetin as like the starring role, but they might have luteolin. They might have other things in them. And again, I use different blends for different reasons, but like this one is called Hista aid. It's from Quicksilver. Again, it's liposomal. So the absorption is great for brain or mouth or anything up here. There's others that I might use more for reflux, but histamine something. Okay. I'd say the second one is glutathione. I love glutathione. It personally has really helped me. And so, I mean, I'm a little bit biased towards it, but I've also, it's by far the most popular supplement we've ever sold. Um, so, and I see a lot of people that like, especially here in town, they maybe saw me like two, three years ago. And now they're, now they're pretty good. They're, you know, if they're, oh, there's a lot of people that if they, if the problems arise, they're going to call me like I'm still their doctor, but they're, or their, their health coach, whatever you want to call it, but it's, I'm still their, their chiropractor, whatever. Um, but they, I haven't seen them for two, three years, but they might still come in and buy glutathione. So glutathione's really popular. I like Apex's. I also like research nutritionals um, as far as my two favorite brands. Um, next might be, well, I mean, as far as just a great one, this is like a butyrate. So again, I'm, mm. seriously, you're like making me realize how much crap I'm sitting on my desk. But this is a, a butyrate supplement from Apex. It's called Tributyrin. Now, butyrate is an interesting one, Ryan, because it's like, probably the one that's the most important, probably the one that most people should be on. If you read like a bunch of autoimmune research and literature and get into the studies and stuff, you're gonna be like, I need to take this for the rest of my life. That's one that I like have my parents take and stuff. But I, it's also not one that's necessarily going to nudge the needle. So in, in the first three months that somebody's working with me, I'm trying to nudge the needle and make sure make them feel better and make them know they're on the right track and, and things like that. So I might not use that right off the bat. But as far as importance, that one's great. The next three, well, I guess it's got to be two because that's one of them is butyrate. But the next two, I often use this gut protocol or this gut combo, I should say, of glutamine powder, which I'll tell you some brands, but a, every brand has a good glutamine powder. Most brands do. Um, but a glutamine powder, a bovine immunoglobulins, and I'll use a butyrate. So this combo, I'll use 
ortho ortho molecular research that's the brand i'll use their product called gluta shield and it's vanilla flavored so that matters in a second and then i'll use sbi protect from the same company which stands for serum bovine immunoglobulins so it's sbi protect it's unflavored it's but it's another powder and then i'll use this uh liquid butyrate from pure encapsulations called sun butyrate and it's vanilla blueberry flavored so if somebody mixes all like two powders and a liquid into a smoothie and they do that every day it's a killer gut protocol so sometimes they might add in a powder probiotic or something like that depending on what they need but if i can get them on the habit of of that that's that's a great habit now the next one while i'm just even rolling i'll come back to no, I think that's everything. I, uh, also with glutamines, I also use pure encapsulations, Epi Integrity, and I also use P Apex's Repair by GT Plus. Sometimes, and I'm, I'll be, I'm always honest with people about why I make the recommendations I make. Repair by GT Plus is probably the most high dose of things for like, inf like a straight up inflamed gut, like IBD, but it also has 60 servings. So sometimes if I want people to take it twice a day, I'm giving them repair by GT plus mm -hmm. instead of one of the others, just because of the number of servings in there. Um, uh, then the next one I would say, even while we stick on powders is called clear Vite. clear Vite is from apex. Also, I do a lot of apex stuff because my mentor is Dr. Karazian. So Datice Karazian is a big name in autoimmunity, a big name in neuro stuff. He's on staff now at Harvard. Um, and so publishes research on autoimmunity on neuro stuff, but especially autoimmunity, that's his specialty. Um, uh, but anyway, he formulates all Apex's nice. products. So a lot of these are Apex products, or even my other mentor in the autoimmune world is named Sam Yannick, and he helps formulate products for pure encapsulations. So I use both of a lot of those because I've learned from both of those uh leaders. But anyway, Clearvite, I use the there's like six different Clearvites. I use one called Clearvite GL. It's the only one that I carry in my office and store, but it's the GL stands for grainless. Grainless? Grain, like no grains, no yep. corn, no, yeah. Um, so again, for the autoimmune people, I just, like, I don't mess with any of the others. If one of them is grainless, then let's just stick with that for everybody. Um, but it's, the, the purpose of it, Ryan, is like, if you look at it, it's got like 75 ingredients in it. But the purpose is for phase one, phase two liver detox. So it's basically a detox powder. And Apex has a pro program, you know, every company's got their programs and things like that, but it's called Repair and Clear. So it's like Repair Vite for the gut, it's Repair the Gut and Clear the Liver. So you're doing those two things at the same time. It's kind of like that push catch, but sometimes just the names of these programs teach people how to apply products in combination also. Um, so yeah, what am I at, like seven or eight? We got, we have six done so far. Wait a second. Really? Only six? Okay. So we have histamine supports, histamine <laughs> aid, yeah. glutathione, uh, butyrate, uh, okay. glutamine powder, um, imu uh, yes, the yeah. bovine immunoglobulins, yeah. and the okay. clear right. That's seven, isn't it? Did I miscount? One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. I have six. Okay, maybe I, I was doing my fingers while you said it, but I might have been doing my fingers wrong. I can keep going. I got a zillion. We carry like 600 on our shelves, 500, 600. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to be generic to say fish oil, but fish oil is just a great one that I'll do. I'll do omega checks on people just to confirm, you know, because what, again, I think that a lot of people, what we're looking for is what's your missing piece. Yep. So a lot of people, if their omega is fine, then guess what? That's not your missing piece and you can keep taking it, but let's focus on what your missing piece is. So I would say another one, vitamin D, and I, I, if I'm, I'm going to throw in combo vitamin D, vitamin A. Um, vitamin D, vitamin A, just really important for permeability, for tolerance, for autoimmunity, for things like that. So I think that was obviously very famous, especially vitamin D. But I also think usually if one fat soluble vitamin is low, there's probably other fat soluble vitamins that are low. So I'll do vitamin D and vitamin A together pretty often. Vitamin A is also in that one that I mentioned called called Gluta Shield, which is the vanilla glutamine powder. Um, so and I just said fish oil, vitamin D, vitamin A. Let's say a couple others, maybe more obscure. Okay, I got two more great ones. 
Both are from Apex. One's called Gabatone. Gabatone. And Gaba is just, a, I would say, an important mechanism for a lot of people. Even in the context of stress, you know, now I'm thinking of three more. So I'm, we're going to 11, right? That's good. Um, good. Gabatone, Neuroflam, and Adaptocrine. So all three of those are brain ones. And they're just big picture brain concept mechanisms that there's a zillion neurotropics. There's a zillion different things out there that are great for the brain. And again, some trial and error things. So let me talk about Gabatone and Neuroflam. So because I got a couple stories. So Gabatone is more for calming nervous system excitation. The nervous system gets overexcited. And if that's in the amygdala, it's going to be fear and panic. If that's in the vestibular system, it's going to be like, why is the room spinning? Um, if that's in other areas, it's just hi hyperactivity of the brain and nervous system, even, even, you know, peripherally. And I always say like, you know, if you, if you had neuropathy, they're going to put you on gabapentin or things like that, but they're just, it's GABA pathways. And this isn't GABA as a direct supplement. You can take GABA as a direct supplement, but this is GABA modulator. So it has things in like B6, magnesium, lithium, valerian root, passion flower, chamomile. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're all GABA modulators. And so that's one. The other one's called Neuroflam for neuroinflammation. You know, sometimes the names are like, I don't know, but the Neuroflam, that's a great <laughs> name because it basically makes a lot of sense. But, yeah. um, so anyway, so two stories, this is, this happened. It was now two weeks ago, I think, but I had two people right in a row that one of them was a guy, he's maybe 29. He's on the East coast. He's got long COVID and a lot of neuro things. And he's doing doing really well. And he said some things like, you know, I haven't needed a, I haven't needed a Zyrtec um, all fall, which was a surprise for him and just different things as far as his gut sensitivities, reactivities. But he said that Gabatone, I noticed immediately, I love that. He said Neuroflam, not so much. Hmm. So it's like, okay, guess which one we're going to stick with? We're going to stick with Gabatone and I would recommend you keep doing that. Then I had another person it's got migraines, dizziness, vertigo, and a Meniere's disease, different things like that. And, and she said the opposite, basically. She was like, okay, Neuroflam is my friend. Gabatone, not so much. So, okay, great. That's a, sometimes these mechanisms are hard to elucidate, even on labs or things like that. But if somebody responds well to Neuroflam, then I'm going to say your brain's probably inflamed. And probably is the key word. I'm not diagnosing them with, with anything. I'm just saying, hey, if you respond well to anti-inflammatories, you're probably inflamed. <laughs> uh, I've had people come to me because they take an ibuprofen and their depression goes away. And they're like, what the heck? Help me look for the root cause of this inflammation. But both of those, Neuroflam, Gabatone, or whatever, in those two nice. order, I, I, both of those are two of my most popular. And I also have people, I... I will recommend to them to find, this is what Karazian says. He says, we know these supplements will work. How do you know how much to give somebody? Ooh. And he says, when you fill your hand and it feels like a lot, add some more. So a lot of times if we're trying to work on some of these mechanisms, a higher dose than what's recommended is necessary. So mm -hmm. sometimes we'll say, take as much as is needed. And I've learned that from several mentors and obviously you know, that's up to whoever you're working with. I don't want to tell people to like go above the recommended amount, but it, you absolutely can. And sometimes that's what it takes as far as nudging the needle to block neuroinflammation or block neuro uh, excitation, um, sometimes higher doses. Now, other supplements, you should not do high doses. You're going to really regret it. So, so it's, there's, there's a slippery slope of just some are better at high doses, some are better low and slow but just kind of knowing how to strategize those. And then the third one that I said, that I think is number 11, is a blend of adaptogens. And again, mm -hmm. a lot of companies have their adaptogenic herbs, a lot of different, even like this product probably has adaptogens, it's called Anxieties, but it probably has adaptogens and some B vitamins and some GABA things. So just combo of things, um, but adaptogenic herbs, are calming for the hormonal system and calming for the nervous system and really decrease the amount of stress chemistry that is produced. So I had even somebody in last week that was like, okay, that, that is a game changer for me. I'm like, okay, sweet. Well, and I even told her at the time, I was like, I'm kind of intrigued to see how you do with Gabatone, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let's just stick with that one right now and focus on something else. She's also just kind of, you know, 
sharing stories, obviously anonymous, but she has had a lot of hormonal issues. Like, like at one point she had, she was bleeding for like months on end. Um, and, and a lot of that's a lot better. And she just had an internal ultrasound that showed a lot of that's a lot better, like the thickening of her lining and different things like that. So sometimes, and we haven't been like, I don't know, we haven't been taking like a hormonal supporting supplements really we've been focused on our gut and detox and inflammation and foods and kind of all the topics that we've been talking about but her cycles improving um and even the internal imaging is improving for that too awesome so so anyway is, i think that was 11 was that 11 that was 11 that was 11 sweet let's go um three so there's three supplements that um I wanted to that weren't on the list or kind of on the list uh, yeah. that I wanted to ask you about. First one uh, being a multivitamin, and I'm going to preface that by saying a uh, good multivitamin, something like thorn or per encapsulations or something that a uh, has the vitamins in the right forms. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on taking like a daily multivitamin for most people? I think it's a good idea. I mean, just in general, I'm not opposed to the idea. I think it's more of a maintenance thing. So yeah. it's not something that's heavily used in my practice, but I do think that, you know, you want to get your, your micronutrient needs and, and, and things like that. So I think it totally makes sense. I'm more, I don't personally take one because I take enough things that have bees and minerals and, and a lot of those micronutrients in them that I don't feel like I'm deficient in any particular one. But I think that covering all your bases from a micronutrient standpoint is just a good idea. I think the micronutrient even testing is very hard to accurately do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that's just a good idea. A lot of people, you know, the most common things I would say are multi fish oil and maybe probiotic. Yeah. Um, magnesium. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Magnesium is super common also. And, then, and super so, good. But again, like if somebody is doing great on it, like I had somebody in recently, I forget if it was the same person, but they're like, I, I'm taking this magnesium, but it helps keep my bowels regular. So I want to stay on it. I'm like, perfect. Stay yeah. on it. You And I always tell people, I'm going to recommend you the assignment and you can do extra credit if you want. There's a, a million good things. And if you read it, like a book on magnesium or let's do a podcast on magnesium. You're like, holy crap, everybody needs this. Um, so I think a multi is a way to just get all those micronutrients. And then, so one, I, uh, I've been fascinated by this past week I've been looking into is L-carnitine. Oh, that's a great one. I took, I took 1500 milligrams of carnitine this morning. Oh, hell <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So so, and, and that, that's one too, right? That could be tested. So like, I see that really commonly on an oat test okay. because the oat test has a whole section for fatty acid oxidation. And it says on many of the markers of the oat test, it says, regardless of cause, supplementation with L-carnitine or acetyl L-carnitine may be beneficial for this marker. So a lot of those mm -hmm. mitochondrial markers are based on uh, fatty acid, beta oxidation and things like that. And that gets blocked by toxins that gets blocked. So I'll show people, I've got a series of studies that I'll show people. And I just like one, two, three, that one says solvents, solvents or aldehydes, but it says solvents are able to concentrate in the mitochondria and accumulation of these solvents in liver mitochondria inhibits fatty acid, beta oxidation. So, and carnitine solves that, or carnitine is the, the, the not, not solve, but you get the point is the need for that but toxins could be the root cause. One time, I also tell this story all the time. One time I was going through somebody's labs and it was like, hey, need for carnitine. She was at the Mr. Olympia competition with her husband, like bodybuilding, and they were in their hotel room. And she was like, hey, hun, haven't you taken carnitine before? And he was like, yeah, bodybuilders take it before shows oh, to exactly. lean up. And I was like, really? That's interesting. I've never heard that before. I'd heard him take a thyroid, but it's like kind of the same concept. I don't I don't really see it work like that for like women and weight loss and things like that. I, I, I think they wish it would. I think that I wish it would, but I think it helps for sure. I think it's a great thing to try for metabolism and weight loss, but there's also some studies that I'll show the pictures of. I've got some cool YouTube videos about carnitine too. Um, like I have one that's called like toxins, carnitine and depression. Mm, and wow. it talks about the neurotransmitter links with carnitine also. So, um, and I think I go through some some studies showing like, you know, 
carnitine carnitine deficiency is linked to depression basically so on the topic of carnitine in terms of fat loss what i've heard was that it's incredibly timing dependent and you have to be there's like a certain window um i think it's 30 to 60 minutes before exercise okay is how you get the fat loss effects and if you don't do it in that time you won't get any fat loss effects interesting what doses have you heard about because i've heard of people doing like up to three thousand milligrams um probably more i'm sure but uh do you know anything about the dosing i think it's uh depending on the person uh what i heard was a thousand five hundred or up to three thousand five hundred that's yeah okay that's about what i've heard too of like you know because a lot of these studies you know they're done in mice and things like that it's hard to interpret but a lot of things again even even once you get past like the surface level like carnitine is good then you see the people that are really nudging the needle sometimes they're taking crazy amounts like there's a lot of b1 therapy right now that's like crazy insane amounts of b1 thiamine um and it's that's what's been shown to be beneficial so i think that those are always intriguing i'm always leery to recommend that to somebody but again i'm just kind of sometimes just leading people towards hey listen to this podcast or this is out there um but yeah i I think that carnitine is a cool thing and a beneficial thing and just generally a high need anything we haven't talked about today that you think is pretty fundamental to your work or just this world of health in general no but i think you said you had a third didn't you say you had three that you oh magnesium magnesium Ah, yeah yeah, I think that different forms of magnesium could be helpful in different ways. But yeah, I think magnesium is a pretty just easy, easily accessible, but just beneficial thing. Uh, and magnesium 3 and 8 is more known across the blood brain barrier. Magnesium glycinate is probably the most popular, but uh, they're all good. This has magnesium taurate, um, and taurine is really calming and helpful for GABA and helpful for gallbladder. But no, I don't think there's anything going back to your question, right? I don't think there's anything that we that we haven't talked about. But again, I think my whole thing is, I think hopefully been illustrated in this interview of just keep all the plates spinning and sometimes your priorities might change. Like, you know, you could be, a, I see world-class athletes that, that lose their health completely because of some other cause or mechanism. So sometimes it's like, you're, you might be the boss of all bosses in the exercise realm, but if you're living in toxicity, I had this person who's a uh, top 10 CrossFit athlete and she, she hasn't had a, she was having breathing issues, long story short, I'm not gonna go too into detail, but she hasn't had a breathing issue since she moved out of her place. And they'd had it mold tested, she had done a bunch of testing, they thought it was all good, I think, but just, you know, the proof was in the pudding of moving out and her breathing improved. So sometimes those environmental things uh, can outweigh something that you're really, really good at. So keeping all those plates spinning, kind of like a golfer, I always say, if you're really smash it off the tee, it helps. But if you suck around the green, you're not going to be good. And <laughs> you need to be a little bit good in all those areas. And you're going to score pretty well. Um, and if you get off track, you just got to get back on track and it happens to everybody. So I think, you know, I'm a golfer, but uh, I think it's a good metaphor for the wellness world. Um, and it's also too, you know, I use it as a metaphor for what I do, because I've taken golf lessons before. And so when I go to my golf lessons, the first thing the guy says, my coach says, he's like, grab your club and start swinging. And he's just watching to see how things are working. And he's looking to see what could be wrong. And he's looking to see did last week's lesson or whatever, did it catch on? Or are you doing that? Or are you not doing that? And he could tell pretty quickly. And if we're, if we're succeeding in last week's lesson, we're going to move on to this week's. But if we're not, he's going to stop me right there and be like, okay, remember this. And we're going to spend the whole time. And then he's going to say, hey, you know, go and practice this in, your, in the next two weeks or whatever. And I'll see you two weeks from now. So that's really, really similar to how my practice works is like if everything's a clicking in one area, then we're not going to be focusing on that area. We're going to be focusing on whatever's lagging behind so we can keep all those plates spinning. Um, so, yeah. Dr. Taylor, click, crick. Um... Dude, I'm so impressed by you. Thank you so much for this episode today. Thanks, Your man. ability to take this, uh, combine the best elements that we have available to us in this world of futuristic medicine and uh, centralized medicine, but also to take this holistic approach and to yeah. use more traditional type of ways of healing. It's uh, 
it's inspiring to see, man. And I appreciate you. Well, thanks a lot. I, I wanted to shout out to my podcast to the autoimmune doc podcast. Um, I got a YouTube channel as well. That's through my clinic, but I just got, you know, different, different, uh, things that I just put out content. And that's even honestly how you and I connected and stuff is like, a, I don't, I never really, I mean, I have my brick and mortar practice in my virtual practice, but I never have a business model behind my, my stuff. I just like educating people on these things, because when you look at some of the science, it's out there. Um, so I appreciate the, uh, opportunity to come on here, Ryan, and, uh, check out my podcast or check out my YouTube channel if you're curious or my Instagram as well. Um, but and check I'll those link out. to all that stuff in the show notes. Dude, Sweet. thank you for this. Have a great one. Sweet. Absolutely.